I think that I felt for many years, ever since I was in my 20s, that something was very wrong with Christianity, that the feminine principle, in spite of the presence of the Virgin Mary, was missing some, something. And as I did more research into the subject of Christianity and also became very interested in the life of Mary Magdalene, I knew that something had been deliberately deleted from the history of Christianity. I knew that Jesus had been married to Mary Magdalene, but I didn't yet have the proof. But after many years of study, and particularly evidence that has come to light recently, which I will show in my webinar, I realized that I was right all the way along, and that this was what was the marriage between Jesus and Mary Magdalene was what was missing all the way through, right from the beginning. And I realized what a huge difference it would have made if they had been, if the marriage had been recognized, and if Mary Magdalene had been given the honor that she was due as co-teacher with Jesus, not only his wife, but co-teacher, that he actually appointed her as teacher to the disciples, I think knowing that he was going to be killed. So this is really a revelation to me. And in reading this extraordinary book, which I will talk about called The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, I realized that it brought all these different threads together both the repression of the fact of the marriage, the fact that she was a co-teacher with Jesus, the fact that she went to France taking the teaching with her, the fact that they were both Essenes, which I didn't know long ago, and that their teaching originated in Egypt, the Essene teaching originated there. And so many things came together. And I think that this book that I shall speak about and um, quote from, is perhaps the most important document we have in Christianity. We, it's the only gospel that was um, at, at the time that Jesus lived. The other gospels were written two generations after he died and was resurrected, but they were anyway later. And one of them in particular was actually a, a copy of Mary's original gospel, which you will learn in the webinar. So that's all I have to say, I think, but this has been a lifelong quest for me. My mother was very interested in Mary Magdalene and I assimilated her interest and then took it on and was able to do something with it, which she couldn't do in her life because of the restrictions on women's life at that time. But now women are much more free, able to speak up without fear. And I can make this contribution to, to you in Chile and to people everywhere. Uh, with a true heart and, and a true conscience. So thank you. I'd like to say as a preamble to this talk that this time we're living in is a time of metamorphosis a time of profound change, when what was hidden is coming to light and what was lost 2,000 years ago is being recovered and restored. We can hear the voices silenced so long ago returning to life. Profound wrongs are being righted, among them the shocking wrong done to Mary Magdalene by the Church of Rome. There are now many books on her published over the last 30 years or so, which show that the feminine archetype is using this channel to activate and spread its influence in the world. We can now know that Mary Magdalene was the beloved consort of Jesus, appointed teacher to the disciples by him and taking the Essene wisdom tradition to France. She was, in the words of Tao Malachi, the holy bride. She may also have been, as Trisha McCannon writes in her book, Return of the Divine Sophia, the most important single teacher aside from Jesus in the entire Christian movement. The growing interest in her reflects the activation of that archetype within our soul and within our culture. So what is her legacy to us at this pivotal time? To begin with, let us take a look at the map of Palestine in the first century, or Judea as it was then called. Look for Jerusalem, sort of just below the middle in, in the center, and a little to the right, Bethany. Bethany was where Mary Magdalene lived with her sister Martha and brother Lazarus, 
and Jesus often stayed in their home after his marriage to Mary and during his mission. Note the name Hercana to the southeast of Bethany. Further to the right is Qumran at the head of the Dead Sea, the place that was home to a community of Essenes at the time of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, who both belonged to a community of Essenes. Jesus lived in Judea, not Galilee. At this time, Palestine, or Judea as it was then called, was under Roman rule, and Rome appointed a succession of kings or rulers with the overall title of Herod. Now I'm going to tell you an extraordinary story which has only come to the light, come to light in the last few years. To understand the historical and spiritual context for the sacred mission of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, we need to go back to the first temple in Jerusalem that was built by Solomon around 1000 BCE. An enormous change in Hebrew cosmology took place in 621 BCE when monotheism was established in Judaism. The Jewish people once worshipped both a goddess and a god, a king and a queen of heaven, who together created the world. The queen of heaven, the goddess Asherah, was worshipped as the Holy Spirit and divine wisdom, whose teaching was compared to the light of the dawn. She was also worshipped as the tree of life, a cosmic tree that connected the invisible and visible worlds, and whose fruit was the gift of immortality. This magnificent temple had an ancient shamanic visionary tradition where in the great tower in the furthest courtyard of the temple, the Holy of Holies, the high priest communed with the Queen of Heaven, the Holy Spirit. In 621 BCE, under a king called Josiah, a powerful group of priests called Deuteronomists took control of the temple. In an act that has affected both Jews and Christians to this day, they banished the ancient shamanic rituals of the high priest and instituted their own rule. They obliterated every trace of the goddess Asherah, the queen of heaven. The statue of the goddess and the great bronze serpent representing her power to regenerate life were removed from the temple and destroyed. Her sacred groves were cut down and all images of her were smashed to pieces. The ancient shamanic rituals of the high priests, which had honored and communed with the Queen of Heaven as divine wisdom and the Holy Spirit, were replaced by new rituals based on strict obedience to Yahweh's law, which forbade the making of images. The Old Testament scholar, Dr. Margaret Barker, writes that it is essential to keep in mind the massive destruction and cultural revolution at the end of the 7th century BCE and to recognize that no complete reconstruction is possible. Yahweh was left as the sole creator God. The divine feminine aspect of the Godhead was excised from Judaism, but also from Christianity, which took its image of God from the Old Testament. In 325 CE, at the Council of Nicaea, the Holy Spirit was named the third male aspect of the Trinity and all connection with the divine feminine was permanently lost in these religions. The Deuteronomists also adroitly demoted the goddess Asherah into the human figure of Eve, giving her the title of the former goddess, mother of all living, and created the myth of the fall in Genesis two and three, with its message of sin, guilt, punishment and the banishment of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden to a life of hardship on earth. We are still suffering from the effects of this myth, which was to become the foundation of the Christian myth and the reason given for the sacrificial death of the Son of God. In this new patriarchal cosmology, the image of deity is the transcendent father. Divine immanence is lost. Earth is designated a place of exile and punishment for primordial sin. It is no longer sacred. Adam is given dominion over the animals, but he is no longer part of the divine order. He is exiled to a world contaminated by the fall and subject to sin, suffering and death, introduced into the world by Eve. Sacred 
Since Eve was the prime agent of the fall, she was to blame for our banishment from the Garden of Eden. And this led to the unrelenting persecution of generations of women who had the heavy burden of the sin of Eve placed on them by the Christian fathers and generations of Christian priests, culminating in their being tried and condemned to death at the stake by the Inquisition, a fate that effectively silenced their voice. How many men have murdered women believing that because of this myth, they deserved this fate? From the perspective of our relationship with the earth, this new cosmology was a disaster. Nature, split off from spirit, was effectively desold. We lost the sense of harmony and trust in the cosmos and the awareness that spirit was active and present within the world. We lost the sense of living within a sacred web of life, a sacred order. It imprinted us with a negative image of our presence on this planet and placed a heavy burden of shame and guilt, particularly sexual guilt, on our shoulders. It is astonishing that this myth, created by a powerful priesthood who removed the divine feminine from the image of God, was held to be divine revelation and has endured for over two and a half thousand years. It has had a profoundly negative effect on two religions, Judaism and Christianity. This is the unhealed wound that lies at the heart of these civilizations, the wound that split nature from spirit, since the goddess had personified nature for thousands of years in ancient civilizations. I need to mention one further aspect to the legacy of the myth of the fall, because it concerns Mary Magdalene. The most significant development ever to take place in Christian theology was the doctrine that Jesus was the son of God, the only son of God. This doctrine was only officially established at the same Council of Nicaea of 325 CE, when amid scenes of furious disagreement between two groups of bishops, it was decided that Jesus was the son of God because he was begotten of God and of the same substance as God, rather than only like unto God. Because of the taint of original sin, celibacy had to be an essential aspect of his divinity and also his immaculate conception. To eliminate the threat to this doctrine offered by his marriage to Mary Magdalene, Pope Gregory the Great in a sermon of 591 CE created the vicious calumny that she was a sinner and a whore. Countless sentimental paintings show her as the penitent whore, rolling her eyes to heaven, as in this one by Titian. This calumny was not removed until 1969 by Pope Pius VI, when she was made a saint, and her name day is July 22nd. However, and most fortunately, the traditions and teachings of the first temple and the image of the divine feminine survived in the Essene communities, which nurtured both Jesus and Mary Magdalene. We don't know which ones or where they were, but they did, and prepared them for their mission. The Essenes were a group of Jews who, rejecting the teachings of the Deuteronomists, had withdrawn from Jerusalem into isolated monastic communities. They were known as therapeuti or healers, practicing techniques of meditation and communion with the higher realms. There were some 4,000 Essenes living in Palestine and Syria in the first century CE, with one group living at the head of the Dead Sea at Qumran, where the scrolls were found in 1947. They shared everything in common and were pacifists holding no weapons. Both men and women were teachers. Jesus and Mary Magdalene both belonged to a community of Essenes. We do not know where this was situated, but it might have been Qumran, not far from Bethany. There are four Essene Gospels discovered in the secret archives of the Vatican by Edward Bordeaux Zicchelli. They were translated by him from the Aramaic originals and published in English between 1937 and 1981. The exquisitely beautiful Aramaic words of these Gospels 
grounded in the images of nature and the cosmos, bring to life the words and essential teachings of Jesus and the elders of the Essene Brotherhood. They have extraordinary teachings in them, particularly the fourth gospel called the teachings of the elect, which includes a dire prophecy about our present time, which is on my website. What is astonishing about them is that they honor our mother of the earth as well as our heavenly father. The Essene teachings also survived in the large Jewish community in Alexandria, where many Jews had fled in three waves, after the Deuteronomist purge of 621 BCE, at the time of the Babylonian destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE, and after the Roman destruction of the second temple in 70 CE. From this thriving city, they found their way into many Gnostic texts, as well as into the teaching of Kabbalah and alchemy. I believe that the extraordinarily rich cosmology of Kabbalah originated in the pre-Deuteronomic Deuteronomic temple in Jerusalem. It was called the voice of the dove and the jewels of the heavenly bride. It is also significant that the alchemists took the feminine Holy Spirit and divine wisdom as their divine guide, whom they named Sophia. Now, in the four New Testament Gospels that are familiar to us, the female companions of Jesus are cited on only seven occasions. In six of these, Mary Magdalene is the first woman named. In the seventh, Jesus' mother comes first. Why would Mary's name appear first of a group of women in all but one of these lists if she were not the wife of Jesus? It is inconceivable, given the social customs of that time, that a family friend, however close, would have been given this prominent or preeminent position. In 1945, an extraordinary discovery was made at a place called Nag Hammadi in Egypt by a man looking for firewood. He came across a jar filled with old scrolls, which he then tried to sell. Some of them, tragically, he gave to his mother to burn as firewood. These Gnostic codices or texts were a hugely important discovery for an understanding of the Gnostics and Jesus' teaching about the inner path to the kingdom of heaven. The discovery restored to the world a library of unknown and extraordinary Gnostic texts that had been hidden in jars probably during the time when the Gnostics were persecuted. Under the reign of the Emperor Theodosius in the late fourth century, or possibly earlier, following an order in 367 CE by Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria, who said that all non-canonical non texts must be destroyed. These texts were eventually published in 1977 as the Nag Hammadi Library and caused great excitement in the world of biblical scholars. Among them, was a hitherto unknown gospel called the Gospel of Thomas, and also the translation of a Coptic manuscript called the Gospel of Mary that has 10 vital pages missing from it. In a text called the Dialogue of the Savior, Mary Magdalene is described as the woman who knew the all and the woman whom Jesus loved. In the same library, the Gnostic Gospel of Philip tells us that there were three who always walked with the Lord his sister and his mother and his companion were each a Mary. And in another longer passage in the same gospel, and the companion of the Savior is Mary Magdalene. Christ loved her more than all the disciples and used to kiss her often on the mouth. For obvious reasons, the scholars who translated these texts translated the Greek word koinonos as companion when describing the relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene, choosing to ignore the fact, quite understandably, that this word can also mean consort or wife. And that is one reason why I have, I have concluded that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were married because of the meaning of that particular word, konoinos. The teaching of Jesus offered the revelation of a direct relationship with spirit 
rather than collective worship. His love for and marriage to Mary Magdalene restored in the mythic sense, the lost relationship between the two archetypal principles carried in the images of Yahweh and Asherah that had been broken 600 years before their time. I believe with Dr. Margaret Barker and Dr. Betty Kovacs that the joint mission of Jesus and Mary Magdalene was to restore the love, wisdom, teachings, and original shamanic healing practices of the first temple. No wonder the priests of the temple and the Pharisees, who clung to the literal interpretation of the law, hated and feared him and wanted to kill him. Now I come to an extraordinary text called The Gospel of the Beloved Companion. You may be aware that the four Gospels of the New Testament were only written down two generations after the crucifixion, dated to circa 33 CE. This manuscript, which has long been in the possession of a Cathar community in southwestern France, is written in Alexandrian Greek. Tests on the original manuscript confirm both its origin in Alexandria and its approximate date to the first century CE. It was and is the most closely guarded treasure of this community from the time it came into their possession until the 12th century when it was translated from Greek into Occitan, the language of the Languedoc area of France. Both manuscripts continue to be held by this community whose name and location are not revealed in order to protect them from the long arm of the Vatican. A little over a decade ago, it was decided that this was a pivotal time in our evolution on this planet and an appropriate time to release it. It was translated from the Alexandrian Greek with a commentary by Jehan de Quillon, a member of this community, and published in French and English in 2010 by Edition Athara in the town of Foix. It is available on Amazon. Prior to this publication, there were three copies of a Gospel of Mary, one of which was included in the Nag Hammadi Library. All three are missing the same vital pages which appear to have been deliberately deleted because of their importance and significance. These missing pages are restored in the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, and they give extraordinary insight into the teaching of Jesus and are very moving as well as electrifying in their implications. It was astounding and also confirming for me to find in this gospel, following everything I have written in the Dream of the Cosmos and subsequent webinars about the Shekinah and the original feminine gender of the Holy Spirit, these words of Jesus or Yeshua, his Aramaic name in this gospel. My words are the way the truth and the life. For my words are given of the spirit and no one comes to the kingdom except through her teachings. Yeshua speaks of the Holy Spirit as his mother throughout this gospel. This different gender of the Holy Spirit is itself a startling revelation. It recalls the banished goddess called Holy Spirit and divine wisdom of the first temple as well as the later image of the Shekinah of Kabbalah. This newly revealed gospel is of immense importance because in my view, it establishes the fact of Mary Magdalene's marriage to Jesus and also the fact that knowing that he would be arrested and executed, he appointed her as teacher to the disciples in her house in Bethany, just before the last supper took place. It also demolishes the Christian myth of the celibate son of God. This gospel, unquestionably written by Mary Magdalene, is the only eyewitness account of Yeshua's mission, crucifixion, and restoration to life. Its value is therefore beyond price. Now I come to a most interesting book on Mary Magdalene, called Mary Magdalene Unveiled by Dr. Anine van der Meer, 
that was published in the Netherlands last February and is currently being translated into English. Dr. van der Meer is an academic who trained in Gnosticism under Professor Gilles Crispel, who was one of the translators of the Gospel of Thomas. She is also the author of a remarkable book on the Black Madonna, published in English in 2020, that I highly recommend to you. According to Dr. van der Meer, a copy of the Gospel of the Beloved Companion came into the hands of the author of the Gospel of John, known as John the Elder, who wrote his gospel at a much later date, circa 90 to 100 CE, in Ephesus. He copied chapters 1 to 20 from the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, but redacted many of them to accord with the doctrinal tenets of the Christian church at that time and the leadership of Peter. He cut out all mention of the marriage of Mary Magdalene and Jesus and changed the feminine Holy Spirit, or God the Mother, into God the Father, and the words beloved companion into beloved disciple, leaving commentators to ponder for millennia the identity of the beloved disciple. Chapter 21 was added at the end of the gospel after John the Elder's death. There were therefore two much later redactions of Mary's original gospel that became known as the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the only one of the four gospels to describe the wedding at Cana. But John the Elder deliberately made no mention of the fact that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were either betrothed or married to each other at this wedding. According to the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, this ceremony took place at Hercana, near Bethany, not Cana in Galilee, as the Gospel of John describes it. Since Bethany was where Mary Magdalene lived, it makes sense that Hercana was not too far away, certainly not in Galilee. This is a painting of the marriage feast by a French artist. The Gospel of the Beloved Companion, as well as Dr. van der Meer's new book, shows that Mary Magdalene, whose Aramaic name was Miriam, was the beloved wife of Jesus. At their first marriage ceremony, which followed their betrothal ceremony at Hercana, I think it was a betrothal ceremony, Miriam, as an Essene or Nazarene priestess, and his lawful wife, anointed Jesus' head with the precious oil of spikenard, a costly and exquisitely fragrant oil that came from a plant in the Himalayas. She did not anoint his feet and wipe them with her hair, as the Gospel of John suggests. It was an Essene custom to have a second marriage ceremony when the bride was three months pregnant, and the second anointing took place at the marriage ceremony which was held in Mary's house in Bethany in 33 CE. It was at this event that Jesus appointed her teacher to the disciples and bestowed on her the title of Miriam the Migdala, or Miriam the Tower, which he said would stand by his in the future. The image of the tower recalls a great tower in the furthest courtyard of the first temple, the Holy of Holies, where the high priest once communed with the Holy Spirit. Only as a messianic bride and priestess in her own right could Mary have anointed Jesus' head with this precious oil. With this second anointing, Jesus could hold the title of Messiah. Shortly after this, Mary was seated next to him at the Last Supper, where she, lay, <coughs> where she laid her head on his breast. This unique sculpture, reproduced in Dr. van der Meer's book, comes from a church in the town of Foix in southwestern France. It shows Mary Magdalene seated next to Jesus at the Last Supper. I do not know the date when it was created, but it is a miracle that it exists at all and shows that in this southwestern part of France, the truth of their relationship was well known.
I think that certain painters of the Renaissance in Italy knew the truth of their relationship, although how they knew it, I don't know, including Leonardo, who drew this exquisite head of Mary Magdalene. In his painting of the Last Supper, he shows a feminine figure in pink, sitting on the right of Jesus and leaning away from him. The figure has been described as the beloved disciple in the Gospel of John, but I am sure Leonardo knew that she was the beloved wife of Jesus, the Holy Bride. At the Last Supper, Jesus said that Mary Magdalene would be the leader and the mother of the disciples, and he appointed her as his successor, the leader of the Nazarenes, as his followers were called. This is a 16th century painting by a French artist, but how did he know that it was Mary Magdalene who laid her head on his breast? To show this scene would have been heresy at the time that he painted this picture. I find all this fascinating. I hope you too, too. <clears throat> then followed the terrible ordeal of his arrest and her accompanying him to Pontius Pilate, and then to the crucifixion where she stood with his mother and sister at the foot of the cross, all of which is described in the Gospel of the Beloved Companion. In this intensely moving painting by Francesco Bonsignori, a 15th century Italian artist, Mary, or Miriam, is shown helping Jesus to carry the cross when its weight had brought him to its knees. In all four canonical Gospels, Mary is described as present at the crucifixion of Jesus, standing with his mother and sister at the foot of the cross. Here in this painting by Giotto, she is shown wearing a red robe and clinging to the cross in her desperate grief. We have to imagine her feelings as a helpless witness of what was happening to her beloved Sir husband. The famous scene of the meeting of Mary and Jesus in the sepulchre garden after his resurrection is only recorded in the Gospel of John. Mary Magdalene would not have been allowed access to the sepulcher, either alone or with other women accompanying her, unless, as his wife or mother or sister, she had come to wash and prepare his body for burial with spices, as was the custom at that time, a custom to which Mark 16.1 testifies. Who recorded this scene in the sepulcher garden? It certainly wasn't Jesus, so it must have been Mary in her original Gospel of the Beloved Companion, before it was copied much later by John the Elder for his Gospel of John. She was in the sepulchre garden because she was his wife, come there to say a last farewell. But there was no farewell, only a radiant dawn. At first she did not recognize him, now restored to life because she was blinded by her weeping and took him to be the gardener. Then came her ecstatic greeting, Rabunai. It was in this garden that Dr. van der Meer believes that she had the ascension experience that I will describe shortly. In the words of the gospel of the beloved companion, Yeshua said to her, Miriam, do not hold to me, for I am not yet of the flesh. Yet neither am I one with the Spirit, but rather go to my disciples and tell them you have seen me, so that all may know that my words are true, and that any who should choose to believe them and to keep my commandments will follow me on their last day. Then Miriam went back to her home in Bethany and to the group of family members and close friends who were anxiously gathered there and who are all named in her gospel. She told them about the miracle that had taken place. And, her gospel says, they knew the truth of her and were all filled with great joy and believed. A week or so later, Miriam, now the appointed leader of the disciples, convened a meeting of them in her house in Bethany to decide what to do next. 
Some had fled in fear to Galilee before the crucifixion and took time to return. Peter was among them. When they had gathered together, she told the disciples what she had seen and what Yeshua had said. The disciples told her that they were worried about going forth into the world and asked her to impart the hidden teaching that Jesus had given to her. Peter said to her, Sister, we know that he loved you more than any other among women. Tell us the words of the rabbi, which you remember, which you know and understand, but we do not, nor have we heard them. In this precious gospel of the beloved companion, we can at last hear the missing words that Miriam spoke to the disciples in answer to Peter's request. It fills in the vital pages of text that are missing from the other three gospels of Mary. Here, the startling focus is the tree of life, which immediately takes us back to the first temple where the goddess Asherah was worshiped as the Holy Spirit and divine wisdom, as well as the tree of life, bestower of the fruit of immortality. Raising her right hand, Miriam then speaks to the assembled disciples telling them about the ascent of her soul that she experienced with Yeshua in the sepulchre garden. What Miriam is describing is, according to Dr. Van der Meer, the essential experience that would have been part of ancient Essene ritual. According to Dr. Margaret Barker, the tower is itself the symbol of the essential experience that was a shamanic practice of the high priest in the wisdom tradition of the first temple. Now, for this next part, I've put an image of uh, the Tree of Life in Kabbalah there, just to remind us of the connection, and because I didn't know what other picture to put there. I have Jehan, Jehan de Kion's permission to quote the following passages. These are the words that Yeshua spoke to Miriam, his beloved wife. Miriam, blessed are you who came into being before coming into being and whose eyes are set upon the kingdom, who from the beginning has understood and followed my teachings. Only from the truth I tell you, there is a great tree within you that does not change summer or winter and its leaves do not fall. Whosoever listens to my words and ascends to its crown will not taste of death, but will know the truth of eternal life. He then shows her in a vision a great tree whose roots are in the earth, which is her body. The tree has eight boughs, which represent the levels of initiation that have to be passed before the kingdom of the spirit is reached, each with its own fruit, which Yeshua tells her, will grant her the light of the spirit that is eternal life. Between each bow is a guardian who challenges those who are unworthy to pass. The leaves at the bottom of the tree are thick and plentiful, so no light penetrates to illuminate the way, Yeshua said. But fear not, for I am the way and the light. And I tell you that as one ascends the tree, the leaves that block one from the light are fewer, so it is possible to see all the more clearly. Those who seek to ascend must free themselves from the world. If you do not free yourselves from the world, you will die in the darkness that is the root of the tree. But if you free yourself, you will rise and reach the light that is the eternal life of the spirit. The following passage describes the initiatory ascent of Miriam's soul through the boughs of the tree. At each level, she has to overcome the corresponding guardian or shadow aspect of that level. The first bow holds the fruit of love and compassion, and the second of wisdom and understanding. And then my master showed me the third bow, which bears the fruit of honor and humility. Only when free of all duplicity and arrogance may you partake of its nourishment. And arrogance called to me, saying, you are not worthy. Go back. 
but my soul was deaf to him and so moved onwards and upwards into increasing light. And then there came the fourth bough, blossoming with the fruit of strength and courage. And I heard him tell me that to eat of this fruit, you must have freed yourself from the weakness of the flesh and confronted and conquered the illusion of your fears. And the master of the world stood before me and claimed me as his own, but I denied him and he had no part of me. Only then, my master told me, when you have rejected the deceiver, can you pass through the hardest gate of all to attain the fifth power and the fruit of clarity and truth. Only then will you know the clarity and truth of your soul and knowing yourself for the first time, understand that you are a child of the living spirit. And as my soul moved upward, I realized that I could no longer hear the voice of the world as all had become as silence. Miriam then sees the sixth bough bearing the fruit of power and healing that can only be eaten when she has acquired the clarity and truth of the fifth bough, giving her the power to heal her own soul and make it ready to ascend to the seventh bough, where it will be filled by the fruits of light and goodness. Then comes this wonderful passage. And I saw my soul, now free of all darkness, ascend again to be filled with the light and goodness as is a spirit. And I was filled with a fierce joy as my soul turned to fire and flew upwards in the flames, from whence my master showed me the eighth and final bough, upon which burned the fruit of the grace and beauty of the spirit. Then she continues, and I felt my soul and all that I could see dissolve and vanish in a brilliant light, in a likeness unto the sun. And in the light I beheld a woman of extraordinary beauty, clothed in garments of brilliant white. The figure extended its arms and I felt my soul drawn into its embrace. And in that moment I was freed from the world and I realized that the fetter of forgetfulness was temporary. From now on, I shall rest through the course of the time of the age in silence. And then, as if from a great distance, I heard the voice of my master tell me, Miriam, whom I have called the Migdala, now you have seen the all and have known the truth of yourself, the truth that is I am. Now you have become the completion of completions. And thus the vision ended. Now the disciples in both the previously known Gospels of Mary and in this translation of the Gospel of the Beloved Companion appear baffled and offended that Yeshua imparted this teaching to a woman and not to them. It is evident that the disciples listening to her revelation had no idea of what she was talking about or what her vision meant. Peter and Andrew said that they did not believe what she said and their words made her cry. Peter said, did he really speak privately with this woman and not openly to us? Are we to turn about and all listen to her? Did he prefer her to us? Then the Migdala wept and said to him, my brother, what do you think? Do you think I have thought this up myself in my heart? or that I am lying about Yeshua? Only from the truth again, I tell you that what I have said is the truth. Levi, another disciple, defends her, saying that surely Yeshua knew her better than all the others, and that is why he loved her more than us. And so, baffled and uncomprehending and arguing among themselves, they went their separate ways. Now, there is an extraordinary manuscript dated to the third century CE called the Pistis Sophia, which recounts a lengthy dialogue that took place between Jesus and Mary on the Mount of Olives, where Mary questions Jesus about the things she wishes to know, and Jesus answers her, expounding the inner teaching of the mysteries. In this text, her name is mentioned 150 times, 
whereas Peter's is mentioned 14 times. Jesus addresses her as thou pure in light. Peter frequently interrupts, grumpily saying that he can't understand why Jesus is paying so much attention to Mary. In one place, she says, I am afraid of Peter, for he threatens me and he hates our race. An obvious misogynist, Peter is described here as well as in both the, the Gospels of Mary and the Gospel of the Beloved Companion, as resenting Mary's close relationship with Jesus and even her presence with the disciples. In the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, he says, let Mary leave us for women are not worthy of life. In the Pistis Sophia, Jesus, on hearing Miriam's description of the mysteries of Sophia, the mysteries of divine wisdom and the Holy Spirit, says, Thou art she whose heart is more directed at the kingdom of heaven than all thy brothers. One can only imagine Peter's jealous rage on hearing these words. This dialogue, said to have taken place on the Mount of Olives, may be the record of their last meeting before she left for France. It is extraordinary that their last conversation together should have somehow been recorded and survived. Jesus is said to have gone on a separate mission to Galatia, a province of Anatolia, and he later traveled to India, Kashmir, and Ladakh. There is no record of their having met again, and this is a strange lacuna in their story. We do not know how, when, or why Mary Magdalene traveled to Alexandria and from there to southwestern Gaul or France in 44 CE, where she lived and taught for over 20 years. It may have been because of the persecution of the Nazarenes or followers of Yeshua after the assassination of the ruler of Judea, which was blamed on them, or it may have been to escape the virulent antagonism of the followers of Peter towards her, arising from their jealousy of her appointment as leader of the disciples instead of Peter. Mary Magdalene, who would have worn the black robe of a Nazarene or a Essene priestess, <coughs> took the Essene wisdom tradition to France, probably sailing from Alexandria. It is also probable that she took with her precious Essene texts relating to the teachings that she and Jesus shared with a close group of disciples, including the gospel she had written. She is said to have founded the Order of the Blue Rose, perhaps a symbol of the Essene wisdom teaching that she brought with her to France. Mary is thought to have landed either at Marseille or at a tiny port called Sainte-Marie-de-la-Mer, not far from Marseille. To this day, gypsies gather here once a year to commemorate her arrival, landing there with a woman called Sarah, who was said to have been black. But this may be a distant memory of the black robe of a Nazarene priestess worn by both Mary Magdalene and Sarah Salome, a sister of Jesus. According to Lawrence Gardner in his book, The Magdalene Legacy, Mary Magdalene traveled to France with two of her two, her two children, her sister Martha, her brother Lazarus, and Helena Salome, who was married to Lazarus. Mary gave birth to her third child, a son called Josephus, shortly after arriving in France. Josephus was later educated at a Druid or a scene University in Marseille. Mary traveled widely in Provence and the Languedoc and taught there for over 20 years until her death in 70 CE. There are many legends about her in this region, and there is even a village called Les Labadou near Rennes le Chateau in the Languedoc, where she is said to have lived. There apparently was an Essene community there. It is possible that the widespread cult of the Black Madonna, of which according to Van, uh, Dr. Van der Meer, there are 450 statues in France, developed after Mary's arrival and reached its height in the Middle Ages. The origin of these statues may have been the cult of the goddess Isis, who was worshiped in France as late as the sixth century. But later on, they could have become the symbol of the wisdom tradition brought to France by Mary Magdalene. 
I can't do more than suggest these possibilities. I have borrowed this picture of Mary landing in Gaul from Dr. Van der Meer's book on the Black Madonna. Apparently, she had a very strong impact on the population there, which has come down to us in the form of legends. In his 13th century golden legend, Jacob de Voragine writes, when the Blessed Mary Magdalene saw the people gather by the temple to offer sacrifices to the idols, she stepped forward. Her demeanor was calm, her face was serene, and with well-chosen words, she advised them to abandon the veneration of idols and preach passionately to them of Jesus. All who heard her admired her beauty, her eloquence, and the sweetness of her message. She is said to have spent the last years of her life in a cave on the saint baume mountain in Provence. saint baume refers to the holy balm or oil of spikenard with which she anointed Jesus' head on two occasions. Her brother Lazarus, who had become Bishop of Marseille, buried her in a small church called saint Maxima la saint baume and there her remains were guarded for centuries by Cassianite monks. To this day, the basilica of that name holds her relics, including her skull, in a shrine devoted to her memory. In the 12th century, a magnificent abbey was built in her honor at Bezelay. I thought it might interest you to see this reconstruction of her head. It was reproduced in the uh, um, National Geographic magazine some years ago. Now I move on to a later aspect of this extraordinary story. As the Christian church became more and more fused with the Roman model of imperial power in the fourth century CE, and more and more intent on the eradication of heresy, the Gnostic beliefs and practices, together with the image of the divine feminine as the Holy Spirit and divine wisdom, had to go underground for many centuries. Astonishingly, they were to re-emerge in 12th century France, in the region of the Languedoc, the very region where Mary Magdalene had taught for 20 years. They emerged as a Cathar Church of the Holy Spirit, or the Church of Sophia, established there in 1157. This church claimed to have the true teachings of Jesus descending directly from the apostles and Mary Magdalene. It repudiated the church in Rome. Naturally, this aroused the enmity of that church. And in 1209, Pope Innocent III initiated the Albigensian Crusade, which descended on the Languedoc with the force of a tsunami. After a hundred years of relentless persecution, the Cathar Church of the Holy Spirit was annihilated together with the people of the Languedoc who had supported it. Up to a million perished by murder, starvation, or torture at the hands of the papal armies and the Inquisition. It is an ancient and fascinating story and also a terrible one of persecution and genocide, but also the miraculous survival of this precious gospel written by Mary Magdalene and known to the Cathars as the Holy Grail. It may have been secretly taken out of the fortress of Monségur by four men abseiling down a sheer cliff just before its capitulation. The following day in March 1244, 210 Cathars who had taken refuge there and refused to recant were burnt at the stake en masse. It was recorded that not a single cry was heard from any of them as they perished in the flames. But later there was a prophecy given by one of the last of the Cathars that after 700 years, the laurel would be green again. Surely this is happening now. <laughs> With the publication of the gospel of the beloved companion. In the 11th and 12th centuries in Europe, 
the feminine archetype was carried in the image of the Holy Grail, which was a synonym for both the Cathar Church of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit herself. An unknown group of people must have transmitted the Essene wisdom tradition in France for a thousand years before it miraculously surfaced during the 12th century, inspiring the building of the great Gothic cathedrals that were financed by the Knights Templar. These were all dedicated to Our Lady. To the general public, this dedication meant the Virgin Mary, but to the initiates of the wisdom tradition, including the builders of Chartres, it meant Mary Magdalene. The Cathedral of Chartres could be mystically understood to embody the lost first temple and to restore the image of the Queen of Heaven, divine wisdom and the Holy Spirit, who was banished from it. The Cathedral itself is a Holy Grail. There is another aspect to this extraordinary story. In the 12th century, at the same time as the teaching of the Church of the Holy Spirit was spreading in southwestern France, the Grail legends suddenly appeared. They were rapidly carried all over Europe by the troubadours, welcomed by the courts of Eleanor of Aquitaine in Poitiers and her daughter Marie in the city of Troyes, east of Paris. The place where many of these troubadours were trained was a tiny town called Saint-Guillaume-le-Désert, not far from Montpellier, whose abbey held a relic of the true cross. At their forest meetings, they are said to have worn red cloaks embroidered with a dove, age-old symbol of the Holy Spirit. The troubadours carried this hidden tradition of the Church of the Holy Spirit, or the Church of Sophia, all over Europe under the cover of the quest for the Holy Grail. They called Mary Magdalene Notre Dame and the Grail of the World. The quest for the Holy Grail, the mysterious vessel or stone that was the source of all abundance, was in reality about recovering the lost image of divine wisdom, the Holy Spirit. The Knights Templar held Mary Magdalene in the highest honor as the patron of their order. They secretly guarded the heretical knowledge that she was the wife of Jesus and the mother of his children. They called her Our Lady of Light because they saw her as the embodiment of Sophia or the Holy Spirit. In 1307, in a minutely planned military operation extending to every part of France, 5,000 members of the Order of the Knights Templar were arrested overnight without warning and charged with heresy and magical practices. After confessions extracted under, extracted under torture, many were burned at the stake, while others were sentenced to perpetual imprisonment. All their lands, castles, and possessions were confiscated. In March 1314, Jacques de Molay, the Grand Master of the Templars, was burnt to death in Paris. Before he was executed, he had prepared 40 Templar boxes, each containing the facts about the life of Jesus. He distributed two of these boxes to each of the senior surviving Desposini families, the name given to the descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. The Templars knew the true story. That is why they had to be destroyed. I wonder whether this marvelous 13th century mosaic from the Basilica of Santa Maria in Shastavari in Rome represents Mary Magdalene seated with Christ, who says to her, Veni electa mea, or come, my chosen one. It is far more likely that he would have spoken these words to his beloved wife than to his mother. Think what it would have meant for the development of Western civilization if the union of Jesus and Mary Magdalene had been celebrated by the church, founded in his name, had their marriage been recognized at the inception of Christianity, the emphasis on celibacy as the path to spirituality might never have existed. We might have been spared the disastrous association of sin with sexuality and the misogyny that pollutes our culture to this day we would have had a living image of a sacred marriage right at the heart of Christianity. 
This may be the time to restore the image of Mary Magdalene as the Holy Bride and undo the harm that has been done by her absence. Tor Malachi writes in the Gnostic tradition of the Holy Bride, from the Sophian perspective, the idea of Christ consciousness being revealed exclusively in a male form, apart from the female form, is considered incomplete and goes against the very nature of our experience. For the life power is equally in men and women, and Christ consciousness is essentially the same, whether embodied in a man or a woman. End of quote. We surely need to know that each one of us, male and female, carries the divine light within us that is called Christ consciousness or cosmic consciousness. The quintessence of the ascension experience was the experience of that consciousness as recounted in the gospel of the beloved companion. In this gospel, the lost first temple tradition of love and wisdom and direct shamanic communion with the divine ground was restored. We only know this because of her gospel, and this is her priceless legacy to us. For nearly 80 years, I have treasured these words received by my mother in a channeled message in the late 1940s, which are more relevant today in view of this talk. The Divine Mother is the Holy Spirit who presides over the new age. Inspired by her, women, through their love and understanding, have been given the task of awakening in humanity the compassion and devotion to life taught by me at the beginning of the Piscean Age. Man, through woman, will realize in himself a sense of his mission on earth and see clearly, as in a mirror, the law of the universe. Thank you very much. <laughs>